So, warmly welcome to all of you uh, on the behalf of the Academy of Democracy, Democracy Academy, and the organizer is Annette Pettersson on that side. We used to be working together, so I've been, also, I've been working with school projects uh, together with her before. But this time we're going to talk about hatred and, and why hate, which of course is a, is a very heavy subject, not only on a Friday afternoon, but the reason why we're going to talk about this is, of course, that many things are happening in, in the world right now, and you can see it on the news almost every day, and it, it can be nationalistic, separatistic movements, uh, like uh, you have ISIS, of course, in the Middle East, but uh, recently we had this last EU election, uh, and probably most of you know that Front National and, and UKIP in Great Britain, both those parties were the biggest ones in, in their countries. And you also had the Danish Folk Party uh, with every fourth of the votes. Uh, so nationalistic ethnocentric parties, uh, Sweden Democrats, also had a lot of votes, as probably most of you would know by now. So we're going to talk both about Sweden and about the world. And we're going to st start off with talking a little bit about uh, how we experience what's happening in the world. And then we will continue to talk more about what we can do about it. And, and, uh, where are the good forces to change what's happening in the world? And we have uh, people that are going to give uh, their impressions from different parts of the world and from different areas in connection with uh, racism, xenophobia, nationalism and, and all this. And me, myself, I'm Anna-Lena Lodenius, and I'm an author and a journalist. And I am, uh, I've been writing a lot about racist parties, uh, writing populist parties, and I'm writing a book that's going to be presented in springtime. Uh, and I'm going to say something about the other people that are sitting here, that, that I'm very happy that you can, could come, all of you. So on my uh, left side, we have Brian Palmer social anthropologist and scholar of religion in Uppsala University. And I think we need to say that you, you have been chosen to be the, the most, most popular teacher in Harvard. Uh, Harvard, I should say. And, and uh, from what I know, that the pupils, they, they choose you. They said that you were the best one. Mm. And, and that was after, which is great, isn't it? And this, this was after 9-11, and, and he was giving lectures about how you can be brave and how you can change things. And, and, and this, they, became, they got to be very popular, so that was the reason why they all went and talked in your seminars. And then we have, uh, of course, there are two people, separate people, as you can see. <laughs> but, but, but I'm going to say something about them uh, as a collective, maybe. So, so Kitty Kurz and... and uh, uh, Kitty Kurz and Kevin Lampe. And they are uh, polit political strategists, uh, organizers, and media relation experts of the political consulting firm, firm Kurz Lampe. And uh, what is interesting to know about them is that they've been working for many, many years with democracy and, and uh, uh, people participating in politics. And they've also been working with Obama, which is quite interesting, I think. So they might share something of that, that experience as well. And I hope that they also will tell us more about what's happening in the state in connection with growing racism and, and from having a, a, a black leader for, for a couple of years. And, and, and because some, some quite terrible things are happening from what I've learned. Uh, and the next person is Soraya Post. And she's, in the, she's member of the uh, European Parliament for the Feministic Initiative. And she's in a social democratic group. And one thing that I wanted to say that I forgot about was that yesterday, in connection with the right-wing populists in, in Europe, I talked to her colleague, Marita Ulvskog, a social democrat. And they are in, because she's in that social democratic group. And she told me also something that's pretty obvious, I think, for everyone. So you might tell you something about that later. That it's getting to be quite normal with those kind of politicians in Europe nowadays. They are sitting there, there are a lot of them, and they are everywhere. And, and uh, many politicians, not you, I understand, and not Marita Ulfsko, but many of the others would consider them to be like any other politicians. Uh, it's a change. Uh, but I, I think that 
primarily why, why we invited you, apart from that you're in the EU Parliament, is because she has a Roma background and, and you have been very much involved in, in rights for the Roma people and you know a lot about that. And that is, a, I think, a very important group to talk about for many reasons. So uh, I think that I'm going to start off with Brian Palmer. And, and as I said, we start off with say, say something about what we have seen in, in, and then we continue with, uh, with the discussion about how to move forward. So, please. I will start locally with a, a few thoughts about Sweden. Uh, it, it, it was a few months ago when Pope Francis uh, commented on immigration in Sweden. He noted Sweden's policy of accepting uh, anyone from Syria who is, is, is fleeing the conflict there uh, as, as having grounds for asylum automatically. And Pope Francis said that Sweden was the only country in the rich world that was doing what every rich country should be doing, giving a place of refuge, a place of safety from, to people f fleeing terrible wars. And he wondered, why was Sweden completely alone in this, in this policy? And so I just want to, to, to name the, the way that Sweden may be something of an exceptional case as regards attitudes to immigrants, to refugees, to immigration, to multicultural society. Um, the political scientist Marie Demker at the University of Gothenburg in her uh, new book, Sveria Ot Svenskarna, with the ironic title, S -S Sweden to the Swedes, um, for Sweden for the Swedes, describes how opinion research over the last five decades consistently shows a, in, an increasingly welcoming attitude toward immigrants and refugees in Sweden uh, right up to the present time. A, a survey, an, a comprehensive survey by the European Com Commission in March of this year found the same thing, that attitudes in Sweden were so much more welcoming than anywhere else in Europe that one had to speak of a Swedish exception. This is not to say that they're welcoming enough. It's not to say that there isn't racism and xenophobia in, in, in Sweden, but that compared to the other European countries or the other OECD countries, Sweden is um, different. If we look at um, the practice of uh, it, 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 admission of refugees, um, 20% of those who this year are given asylum in the European Union are given asylum in Sweden. And 35% of uh, children under 18 arriving alone for asylum to some European country come to Sweden. Uh, so so in, uh, in attitudes as well as in practices, Sweden... Uh, Sweden is exceptional. We, we could compare with uh, similar neighboring countries. Take Norway, um, a, a much uh, stingier policy toward, uh, toward, toward refugees, m made, m made vividly so when Norway uh, a few months ago refused to accept, I believe it was 165 UN quota refugees because they were handicapped. And the uh, uh, Norwegian leader said it would be too expensive to give them the kind of medical and, uh, and, and, and health care that they need. This in the country that in some rankings uh, is the world's second richest after Qatar, thanks to Norway's oil money. Uh, the contrast with, with, with Sweden couldn't be um, more more, more, more stark. Similar with Canada, often thought of as a great uh, immigration country, and it is. Um, but there too, Syrians arriving are selected out according to 
uh, who is useful for the labor market, who has uh, expensive skills uh, that, that will help the economy, uh, questions that uh, Sweden does not ask because uh, the focus is not on what we need, but what, on what people fleeing from conflict need. Um, so so I, I, I just raised the question of how Sweden developed what seemed to be the strongest anti-racist movements and tendencies in the rich world uh, and um, movements that many of you in this room and on this panel are part of and, and a discussion that, that, that you are contributing to. I'll, I'll, I'll save some other pieces for our discussion. Uh, <clears throat> so then, then we need to, do, I think we save that question. I mean, is it really true that we are so much better than all the others? I mean, do, I mean I'm quite impressed by the facts that you're presenting. But if you think differently, we should say something about that. Mm -hmm. And the other question is, of course, why? Maybe you have some ideas about that. Uh, please, Kitty, could you share some ideas on the subject with us? Good afternoon. One of the reasons that I'm here today is because I'm scared to death. I'm scared to death about the rise of the hate movements that I have seen with the Svea Demokraten in Parliament, with the Front National and UKIP from Britain. And the reason why I'm so scared is because I am a historian and I understand that trends that happen in Europe very frequently end up over on the other side of the Atlantic in my country. And in my country, all the crazy people and all the people who hate have guns. I'm, it's not really a joke. It's kind of funny, but think about it. Just in the last couple months, we had... Um, and we've got all kinds of people who are hating each other. We had... Um, someone break into Parliament and try to shoot members of Parliament in Canada. That same week, we had a, um, an anti-Semitic shooting in Illinois, but you didn't even hear about it on the news because they didn't actually hit anyone. They went and shot at a synagogue. They destroyed things in the synagogue, but they didn't actually <laughs> kill people, so we don't need to talk about it on the news. That's scary. A couple of months before that, in Kansas, in the middle of the country, you know, what we think of as very safe middle America, another um, neo-Nazi went into a synagogue, um, sorry, a Jewish community center, and came into the parking lot and came into the lobby and just started randomly shooting and he wasn't that successful because he only actually ended up shooting Christians, not Jews. But people are getting killed every day, not only because of who they are, but because of where they happen to be standing. But it's not random. It's hate motivated. And what you all are experiencing here with the hate parties coming into power in politics is one of the only bright lights that I see in the United States that hasn't happened. Because of our two-party system, it's harder for minority parties to gain a foothold in electoral politics. So we haven't had that kind of change. We haven't had that kind of entrance into the halls of power. But the guns and hate is a lethal combination. And the guns and hate and the presence of a black man in the president's chair has been almost too much for the hate groups to deal with. In the year 2000, there were approximately 100 hate groups that the Southern Poverty Law Center tracks. And those are all kinds of hate groups, racist, black against white, anti-Semitic, um, anti-LGBT, anti-government. We've got a lot of different people hating in the United States. Um, but there was about 100 groups in 2000. In 2012, by the second time that President Obama ran for re-election, 
there was 1,218. That many groups. And these are just the ones that are public, that people are able to track and find out about. This isn't the 75 people meeting in someone's basement and plotting something in their small community. Um, I'm happy to say that since 2012, there's been a slight decrease um, down to about 1,000 instead of 1,200, but still, it's a little bit much. Um, for the last, as Annalena said, we do human rights work, but we also do electoral politics. So for the last six weeks, I've been traveling around the country with Vice President Joe Biden, who was campaigning for members of the Senate and the House of Representatives running for re-election. One of the places that I went with him was to Arizona, to the district where Congresswoman Gabby Giffords had represented. And do any of you know what happened to Gabby Giffords a couple years ago? I see a lot of heads nodding, but she was at a town hall meeting at a grocery store, meeting with voters, talking to them about their problems, and someone came into the grocery store and shot her and shot several members of her staff and a couple random people. Um, we don't know what motivated this young man. This young man might have been just a crazy person or might have been motivated by hate. No one's ever really kind of gotten to the bottom of it. But I know that as someone who works with public figures and politicians every day, I know I was a little concerned about the public events that we were putting on with Vice President Biden and with his wife and the member of Congress who now represents that area. The Secret Service was on edge. And the more I talked to them, the more I realized they weren't just worried about one lone gunman, but all throughout Arizona and Nevada and Utah, there is an increasing anti-government movement. And remember I told you, our crazy people have guns? Last summer, I, I, don't, I never am sure what which pieces of news go back and forth across the ocean. But did any of you see when they, um, at the ranch in Nevada, they were holding up, they had about 250 people camped there with rifles hold, um, that were assaulting federal agents and telling the federal agents that they couldn't come on the land even though it was federal land? Did that... Any, any news over here? Yeah. So those kinds of people are showing up all over the place. The anti-Semitic people are showing up all over the place. I haven't even touched on our anti-immigration feelings, which in our case are mostly um, against people from Mexico, Central America, Guatemala. But all this hate just keeps boiling up. And I keep asking myself why, and especially in a country where, other than the Native Americans, we're all immigrants. We all came from somewhere else. And the same arguments are being leveled against immigrants today, against the Mexican Americans that was, were leveled against Greeks and Italians and Irish and even the Swedes over the generations of immigration. So I'm here today not only to tell you what's going on in the US, but hopefully to get some of your feedback too about why hate. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, of course, not all of this will end up in our media. Uh, some of it will, um, I mean, it differs a lot. One thing that struck me with the things that you said was that, that some of the things that are going on in Europe will end up in the States. And we are, at least for me, talking for myself, I have a feeling that it's rather usually the other way around. I think it, where, where you stand depends on where you sit. Mm. So maybe <laughs> we feel like some of the things are coming at us, mm. but you feel like, and, and I understand our pop culture too is so huge mm. that mm. you have here. I think one of the bad things about the internet and television might be that it's more back and forth now and 
during the discussion, I'll talk a little bit about how a bunch of our hate groups were over in Budapest last week meeting with the European hate groups to try to learn from them. So it's maybe back and forth. Probably, probably. Uh, and of course, you get horrified from, I mean, knowing how many presidents that were killed in the States and, and this, this uh, gun culture and all this. Uh, I think we move forward. Uh, Soraya, would you like to come forward and, and, uh, and share? Get up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. H hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here and to share my views of uh, this uh, title, Why Hate? And... Okay, it's so. good to hear that Sweden is so very good. Um, uh, but still, uh, if we compare with what we should expect from ourselves in 2014, after two world wars, after the Holocaust, maybe we are not so good to really live with respect to the human rights and to the declaration and convention we have signed. So I have that one and the other side also, of course. And just for an example, we also say that Sweden is comparing to other countries, we are based on gender equality. Okay, we are based, but we are not gender equal. So, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so I won't take too much time because I have a talent to uh, speak too much. So I wrote, I'll tell you when, you, when you're too Okay, lengthy. good. So I wrote down uh, a text which okay. will limit the time. Okay, thank, okay? You, thank you very much. <laughs> Makes yeah. it easy for me. Yeah. So uh, nationalism is the notion of one country, one people, one church, one culture and one sex. With nationalism comes rejection of people who are different for different reasons. It can be their color of skin, their ethnicity, or their cultural background. The Sweden Democrats have their background in the fascist movement, and the racist ideology is deeply rooted in their party program. However, they have substituted race with culture in order to cover up. And we are there to see and to understand, of course. And they have so far been very, very successful. For example, in public service media, it is not allowed to call Sweden Democrats for racists. And many private media companies have the same policy. And racism itself seems to be considered as just another opinion in the political in the political debate. In the run-up for this year's election in Sweden, Nazis have been allowed to speak in public places, protected by national police, even though their message goes against the fundamental values signed of our democratic society. And it has happened in a hospital that people who work there they were not allowed to wear, to wear pins with anti-racist logo. So, uh, and all this happens in a time when the Sweden Democrats is the third biggest political party in Sweden. For me, this is a wor worrying, worrying, yeah, development. Because it is a sign of how the public norm is changing. When the government institu institutions do not take their responsibility to uphold the fundamental values of our society, but instead follow the public opinions, even when it goes against our own constitution and the charter of fundamental rights, there is a fact to be worried. We can see in other parts of Europe how politicians and the media have been following and encouraging a nationalist and racist public opinion in order to gain votes and to sell papers. I mean, a lot of politicians out there do not stand up the values agreed because they won't be elected. So politicians sitting there in parliaments cannot do the work they are supposed to do because they don't follow 
the missions, they follow the public opinion, which is in a, many ways very racist. And when politicians move in this direction, nationalism and racism becomes the unquestioned norm. Last week, I hosted a hearing on the walls that have been built up in Europe to separate the Roma communities from the mainstream population. In order to build such walls, there, there is a need to be a consensus between politicians and the population that the Roma community do not deserve the right to be a part of the local community. Recently, we commemorate, yeah? Yeah, commemorate, yeah. Yeah, the fall of Berlin. Mm -hmm. And in the same time, we see mental walls and physical walls arising in Europe. So there is time to be scared and to worry, of course. We have seen this happen before in Europe. We ought to be learned by this. We have fast it. And we have to look at the signals, which was at that time, are the same signals today. So there is time to be worried. Because we see it happen again, of course. There are several, several explanations to how nationalism raises among people. A common view is that these people live in a small towns with little means and feel that the society they knew and the welfare system that they had is dissolving. They are afraid of what the society is becoming and they idealize. I mean, some words are very difficult to say in English. <laughs> and they need to find a suitable scapegoat that threatens against their romantic idea of what Sweden should be. In this analysis, people tend to concentrate on the economic aspects. That's the reason for racism in, is the crisis the downsizing of welfare society, the helplessness people feel when they realize that they lack the opportunities that other people might have. These aspects might be interesting, but my first question is why people need to canalize their fear to racism and hate. And the, and the reply is because racism is there and it has always been there, in good times and in bad times, there is always racism. It's a way how to handle and how to see it. Am I losing time soon? Yeah. <laughs> and this racism needs to be fought not by speaking to races on their own terms, because when we do this, society moves towards a change of norms. On the contrary, we need courageous politicians who can let go of short-term political gains and gather across the party lines to stand up against racism and nationalism and for the protection of the fundamental values of our society. We need public authorities that stand up for these values and that keep our public spaces free of racism and hate. We need to see the existing tools we have and ask why we don't see them and use them. And we need, and why we take away individual citizens' responsibility for being a real actor in a society, to build a society, to keep the society with the values we agreed on. And why are, don't we let individual citizens to defend the society and act. And how come that we doesn't know about these tools? I mean the conventions, the, the declaration of human because I see these as tools coming up from a knowledge after the world wars, the two world wars and the Holocausts. So there are tools but the society doesn't know about them enough, and the politicians, the, the authorities, they don't use them. So when it comes problems or crisis, they ask us, what are we going to do? They don't know how to act. And this is very strange for me, how we can let hate grow, not using the tools we had. I mean, this woman with her committee, Eleanor Roosevelt, Roosevelt she was great. 
She made it very simple for us, actually. So, go out, spread the word <laughs> about love, about the values we have been, and this is to gain a society. This time is a bad time for Roma. It has been long his history, a bad time for Roma, but especially now, we are the scapegoats of Europe. You keep are using them, Sweden Democrats used with a poster during the election, and anti-racist raised their voices. But it wasn't enough. They got 13 percent. So one of the speakers in our parliament in Sweden, Björn Söder, took a place. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> we, we, we get back to that. Huh? <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Freya. Uh, I'm sure Kevin could pick up on that. Uh, do you want to sit or do you want to... Oh, whatever I'll, you like to. It's I like to walk around. Okay. Just to give you a little background, uh, since 2008, Kitty and I, my, my wife uh, and business uh, boss, not necessarily partner, um, <laughs> have been uh, traveling to Sweden uh, as well as around the world working on a variety of political campaigns and social justice causes. And we have observed a lot. Uh, we're fortunate to work with, uh, you know, great humanitarians. If you've seen the movie Hotel Rwanda, um, Paul Rosses Begina is one of our clients. We've worked with him. We've done such a good job with him. And he went to the, to the uh, Human Rights Days. Human no. Rights Days last yes. summer, last, last year. In and Stockholm. In yeah. Stockholm. We took him to Peace and Love, and we took him to Almadalen. Uh, we've done such a good job with Paul that the... Uh, Rwandan president would like to see my wife killed, um, which is always a good sign when you piss off a uh, African dictator. Um, I mean, that's a marketing tool for me. Um, but this um, recently, um, I became so frustrated after participating and observing Swedish politics. I uh, I wrote an op-ed in um, and forgive me uh, in in uh, in um, Dagis Samhella. How did I do? And the title of the op-ed was. It's time for Sweden to stop being Swedish about the Sweden Democrats. <laughs> and it is a born, oh, thank you. So then you get the point of my talk now. Um, I wrote this as, as your American cousin who loves you all very dearly and sees something terrible happening, is that a group of people are preaching an awful, awful manifesto. And it's been said that for bad things to happen, all it takes is for good people to do nothing. Uh, it now is the time to stand up to the Sweden Democrats. And more importantly, when you have an opinion about it, you need to share it. It is no longer like being on the train and not looking at everybody or not letting them have the extra seat next to you. It is all about standing up and saying what needs to be said. Because if you do not say it here, it is not going to be said there. And it is very frustrating to sit back and watch. Uh, we are regulars at Alma Dolan every summer, Kitty and I. Uh, two summers ago, we went to the Sweden Democrats' speech. Uh, this summer, we decided not to go and to go watch Oz Noyen, uh, where we had um, more than twice as many people saw Oz give a comedy concert and boycott the Sweden Democrats' speech. These are the type of actions that need to be taken. But two summers ago, we were at the Alma Dolan speech. We're watching the Sweden Democrats as they give their address. And there's a group of about 10 or so young women. And they're protesting the Sweden Democrats. And have these wonderful signs that say, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I thought, this is beautiful. This is so beautiful that somebody's actually standing up and saying something and doing it effectively. And, and then I watched the reaction from the Sweden Democrats. As, as they like to do, they took their cameras out. And they're sticking their cameras in everybody's face and taking pictures of these protesters, these young women. And, and, and as the women were just doing very quietly and very subtly a, a brilliant, simple protest against the rhetoric of the Sweden Democrats, the cameras started to get more aggressive. And they started to stick the lens in the face of these young people. And I got to admit, my American took over. I turned into Bruce Willis from Die Hard. <laughs> And I used a lot of eight-letter words and a lot of four-letter words. 
to a person who was at least two feet taller than me and told him what I would do to him and what I would kick if he did anything to harm that woman. And maybe it doesn't take a threat of violence, but maybe it takes a threat of intellectual aggressiveness. And that is what I'm charging you all with today, is please stop letting the Sweden Democrats act the way they are just because we can't talk about it. Thank you very much. So, okay, thank you very much. Uh, just one reflection. Uh, you know, populism, it means a lot of things, but one thing it means is that makes, you make things too simple. Complicated things you make too simple, which means you're actually lying, usually. And we need to keep more than one thing uh, clear for us at the same time. And I think that this is a, a good presentation of that, because all the things that you say, although it might seem like they're not saying the same thing, but it's actually part of the truth. We are probably the best in the class in many ways. And at the same time, we have other pictures of what's going on. And this is not populism. This is to, to tell about things the way they are, I think. So I'm very happy about that. Yeah? It is challenging for Americans because in America, populism is actually grown of the people and is actually a term used for more progressive, uh, more idealistic leaders. And so it's always, it's, this is a challenge of, of, of rhetoric in the English language. Yeah, so when you're talking with Americans about populism and they're all for it, it's because they want the grassroots movements to rise up, yes. but in a good way. So it's a little bit challenging. <clears throat> but I think the point you make, Annalena, and why for us as Americans and why for other countries to look at the rise of the Sweden Democrats and be so frightened about it, we think, whoa, 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 if this can happen in Sweden, intolerant, accepting, loving Sweden, what's going to happen in other countries? Mm -hmm. I, I want to let Annette, you know, the organizer, my, my, my companion from Democratic Academy, <laughs> uh, so what, what do you think when you listen to, to all of them? Yeah, I think it's, uh, first of all, I'm so grateful, you know, this is my lovely, lovely dream come true to have these beautiful people sitting today together and talk because you know you meet people in life and you go like okay one day I want to do this seminar so people can hear the voices together you know and it's just to do it and I, I'm sitting here and I'm feeling so proud I'm so so because these people they know so much and they are struggling every every day for making democracy and human rights for real as I am also. So the things I hear and the things I really want to say to you all is, I think I would start with Soraya because I'm working every day. I give in my life for, for making democracy work for real in Sweden and international. Working practice with youths working with people who are teaching youths, working with people who are working when, or on our spare time, doing everything to make people happy and having a good life. But serious, the Swedish school have failed. Because we have the laws, we have the, the structures in Sweden, we have everything, the fundamental values, if you go to school, it says you need the tools to be a good democratic individual, and you need to have the tools to say no, because you know, what is democracy? You, it's you and me living in a group. The value is that we are treating each other as equal. We are treating each other as equal every day. Every person I meet in the subway, Every person I meet in, at my work, I should smile and say, hello, we are different, but it's okay. It's up to me to know that it's non-tolerance in Sweden for discrimination. And when I'm out in the schools, the teachers haven't forgotten that because they don't act when they see discrimination. The youths don't know that we have no tolerance in Sweden for discrimination. 
they think it's okay to, to be discriminated. Something has gone wrong. You know, it's up to us to defend the values. And it is, if you're going to live in a democracy, we are going to treat each other as equal, and we are different, everybody. But you and I, in our everyday life, we must stand up and fight for it, and not look away when we see something happen. The third thing for a democracy is that we have one voice. You can tell whatever you like. To ev you have the freedom of speech. You can start a forening association if you like. You can make a change. We got the tools, as Soraya says, but we don't use it. We have everything in Sweden. And the Sweden Democrats, my friends, they are not a democratic party because they have this value that everybody is not equal. Understand? It's really scary and nobody talks. And the third thing I want to say is, I think we need to talk about uh, how to start, the politician needs to collaborate between the moderates and the social democrats and everybody. They need to go together because if we are at war, we, the only way to, to stop a war is to start strategic to discuss what, what Sweden do we want. And I think the best Sweden would be if the Sweden Democrats run out from Sweden, for sure, disappeared. And it's up to us to make it happen. So I need, I'm, I'm so interested in this. Yeah, we are the best in the world, because it's true in statistics. But nay. So I would, like to hear, I would like to hear what should we do, but I know... Because this is, this is what we're heading for, in I think, more and more. In our everyday life, yeah. we mm. need to do more. We can't just sit there mm. and just say... Because we have... A, if you are employed in the local government, as a teacher, uh, whatever, business uh, <coughs> uh, head or everything, you need to do what's the, what is your purpose. It's to, to follow the, the rules. Mm. And the rules is to make the democracy work for everybody. We pay taxes for this, their salaries. Hello? Mm. Thank you. I mm. think so. So I'm really crazy about this. And I want to talk yeah. more. So, uh, Kevin, please. It is, uh, there is a tremendous opportunity that exists right now. Um, if they say in organizing, it's easy to organize the mad people, the pissed off people. And I, I think uh, bubbling below the surface of Swedes right now is a frustration about the Sweden Democrats. And now is the time to take advantage of that. Um, the next op-ed I'm working on is I, I see the opportunity for on the budget that's coming up um, for the moderates and the social democrats to get together and to form a coalition against the Sweden Democrats and put together a budget that's good for the country and good for everybody, but reflects the real values of Swedish society and not the values of the Sweden Democrats. I think there is an opportunity there for a bold gesture to be made. Uh, I think also then there's an individualistic opportunity among Swedes to stand up and start saying things and start talking about this and start putting the pressure on their elected officials to do something that is right for all of Sweden, not just their own political parties. Uh, Soraya wanted to say something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about this issue, we have to work in long time. We have to have a long time perspective and work constantly with this. We can never rest because, as I said before, racism is there and it has always been there. It depends on the society. Different issues might appear what give it strength to why it got stronger in some times. Okay? So it means that we have to know about the tools. We have to be educated from early ages. We have to know how ra racist ideologic political parties act. What kind of strategies? What is their strategies? We have to know the enemy and we have to look at racism as something very, very dangerous and very ugly. And if we don't do that, if we don't look at it as ugly enough, 
it will grow. And the strategies will become stronger and more unified. And they have no limits. They work strategies country by country. I mean, UK, Sweden, Democrats, National Front, Yobi, they work together. They are building their strategies together to fit their own country, of course. And when the time is coming, they will use it together. Yeah. And we need, okay, and we also need to, uh, this is also what we have to learn in school, the strategies. And we, ha we shall not be afraid. We have to stop to be afraid to talk about these kind of strategies because we also have to create a strategy against it. We cannot sit and just wait. There is no time for that. And we also have to be more aware of the signals and don't close our eyes for when it comes signals. I used to say like this, there has been, there has been a time of dehumanization and this has to end. And there is, has also been a time uh, when you don't need to take your responsibility. I fix it. I'm a politician. I do the work. This is a way of dehumanizing your capacity and your responsibility also. And because I think every single one of us has the responsibility to know about the tools, to act as a citizen, with equal value, values, and I mean, it's a privilege to have the right of citizens and political rights. It's not only to throw a vote to, in an election, take care of it. It's important because it creates tomorrow. Uh, just briefly, um, what Soraya says is so true. You need to know your history. You need to make sure that the younger people know what happened in World War II and know what happened in Rwanda and Cambodia. And the dehumanization is one of the first harbingers of hate is when in Rwanda they called people cockroaches. You need to know this. You need to know history or you will repeat it. But I also want to emphasize what you talked about, having the tools. That's a really important thing that we don't talk enough about, that we do have laws and we do have tools to combat this. But in your own life, you really need to work at it. Because remember, hate doesn't come out of nowhere. Hate is taught. These people are being taught hate by somebody. What, who, who's doing it? Stop it. Go and intervene. And the younger that you can get people and teach them that love is pow more powerful than hate, the easier it's going to be over the long term. Brian, please. Growing up in, in New York City, I remember learning of a famous Supreme Court decision uh, that had taken place earlier uh, in the 1970s, uh, the Skokie case, where uh, a group of Nazis wanted to have a uh, political parade through a predominantly Jewish neighborhood of Skokie, Illinois, uh, outside Chicago, and the Supreme Court decided that they could indeed uh, have a, 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 a march through that neighborhood. And, and as the son of a Jewish mother, I remember feeling proud of, of my country for being so open to uh, the, the range of ideological positions in the land that even people who I, whose views I abhorred uh, had, had, had a, a right to ex express them publicly. And I saw that as a, a sign of a a, 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 a well-functioning democracy. The, the anti-racist movements in Sweden have mostly had a, a, a somewhat different approach, an attempt to, to isolate, to ostracize, to, um, to, to separate um, parties that are, that are considered, uh, that, that are considered objectionable from uh, f from from us others who who are humane and 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 and, and good, uh, and many many political scientists, in, in, including Marie Dempker at at, at Gothenburg, 
um, make the point that that has in some way been a great gift to the Swedish Democrats, Sweden Democrats, that they can describe themselves as mobbed, as, as mistreated, as, as not respected, uh, and, and as victims, and, and that they have won, won uh, a, a fair bit of support because of that, um, among the many different uh, reasons that, that bring people to uh, to vote for them, uh, which can range from anti-immigrant feelings, anti-feminism, uh, various kinds of national conservative uh, ideologies, uh, all of which I uh, abhor. But I, but I think that we have to be specific in our criticisms of our political counterplayers. And, and as Demker writes, Always, always treat them as counterplayers, people we are debating, and, and, and never as enemies who have to be eliminated from, from our society. Whoever those 12.9% who voted for the Sweden Democrats are, uh, we're not going to eliminate them from Sweden, you know, send them all to Texas or something. Uh, so We'd have a special place for them in Texas. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, and I think that uh, when, when we sit uh, at the, the, the left party uh, Valvaka in Stockholm, the election celebration, when the Sweden Democrat numbers came on the screen uh, and, and, and everyone chanted, uh, Inga Rasister Povora Gator, no racists on our streets, um, in some way we need to be more specific about that than, than, than simply assuming that that all of their voters are are hardcore racists and and instead specify what it is that we object to what it is that we we we, we are are valuing uh, in the society's values and I think Kevin did that beautifully uh, at at Almadalen because he was specifying uh, taking pictures of your political opponents uh, is, is an attempt to it, intimidate them. It's an implicit threat of violence. I'm going to use your picture to, to identify you and come and hurt you. So, so he was saying that that's not an acceptable form of, of, of politics in a democracy and that if we stay to that kind of specificity and avoid our sweeping slogans, we will, we will actually make much more progress and not, not give our political counterplayers the, the gift of being seen as victims. One of the byproducts of that decision that, please. <laughs> One of the byproducts of the Supreme Court decision that, uh, that, that Brian was talking about was the fact that one, people went out and protested that march and more importantly, people organized around that march, and then it created more of a discussion. I remember being in high school at that time, and we talked about it at the lunch table, at the jock table, okay? Those, you know, the football players, the wrestlers, and, and those of us who were, people didn't necessarily think intellectuals, turned to Dave Grobart and Sam Goldsmith, the only Jewish guys sitting around the table, and go, what does this mean? And then we got to learn that, you know, Dave's parents were, um, um, you know, he doesn't have grandparents because they lost them in the Holocaust. These are things we didn't know, but we created that discussion, and because in America we created that space. Now, on the other side, um, I got to watch the movie The Blues Brothers in a park in Chicago uh, of this summer, or the summer before last, but there's a scene in The Blues Brothers where they make fun of the Nazis. These particular These Nazis. particular These Nazis. Totally Nazis. And... It was the biggest applause line was when the Nazis were humiliated in the course of the Blues Brothers. Movie. In the movie. And I thought, this is wonderful. There's a great line where, where one of them turns to another and goes, I hate Illinois Nazis. And the crowd just cheered because the crowd has been under watching this, they've been participating, and they've said no. And it becomes part of our pop culture to fight against this. And I think there's where where maybe a little bit of Americanism can be, um, uh, be spread here in Sweden. 
We have five minutes left. I, I want to say something very briefly uh, in connection with something that Kevin said a long time ago. <laughs> but still, of course, the problem is also a connection with, I mean, with what you said. Of course, it's a problem that we have like this real Nazis and, and uh, looking at Europe like Golden Dawn. I mean, they could be Nazis and fascists, whatever. And we have this uh, Svenska Motståndsrörelsen in Sweden and those that are sort of obvious ones. And then we have this much more soft ones. I mean, I spent some days with you, Kip, this spring. And they are quite gentle people, and, and they talk about loads of other stuff, and then now and then they talk about migrants, and they are not promoting violence and hatred, but still, they, they are a very difficult party, because if you really look at what they're doing, you can be say that it's no good that they are as big as they are, but still, they are as big as they are, because they are a little bit softer. That's the reason why more people are going for them. So it's, it's a good way for them, a good tactics. Uh, so it makes it all a bit complicated. And, and you said that they sh the, the, the right and the left should go together and, and agree on something. And that's also a bit complicated because, of course, the people that are going and putting their votes for Sweden Democrats, they have this idea that the establishment, they are pushing them out and they're always agreeing on everything and they are like outsiders coming there. And, and so if, if the establishment agrees on everything, they could do that now and then, but they can't do it all the time because that, that makes them even more, these outside guides, that, uh, that probably makes the party grow and even more. So it's, it's a, bit, a bit complicated, <laughs> uh, time's running. And, and I promise you that you, you could ask something, and, and I'm, I'm, this is ridiculous because we have like four minutes left. Uh, somebody wants to say something. Yeah. I would want, I want like to ask Anna-Lena, you know, I've been working with you for a long time, uh, and and I think you know, for me, it's like how to destroy hate. It's mm -hmm. to that I give love to everybody I meet. You know, it's love, peace, and love that are going to to put away hate. And I know that you have like these tools. Because it's all about fear also, because I know when I talk about Sweden Democrats, my mailbox go like uh, bombing, okay? Mm -hmm. But I know that you have talked a lot, a lot, a lot of, during your years with people, how they should do when they meet the people who comes with this anger and hate. So I would like you to give us some small tools when so we So that will leave the rest of you out, will you? Yeah, <laughs> because I think everybody needs some small tools oh. to help them uh, yeah, fight for hate. I, I, can, I can make it very short. Yeah. I mean, one of the main things is, I think, that we should not be afraid. And this might seem like a contradiction because you're talking about them killing each other. I mean, or us or whatever. So it's, it's not an easy thing to say, but most of the people that you meet will not be, be those kind of killing ones. You will meet more ordinary, uh, xenophobic, uh, maybe slightly racist people. And you should not be afraid, because one important thing is that we are not distributing fear and hatred. We should actually have a discussion going on, and you should be many of you, all of you should be able to talk about these things, and it should be fairly normal. You should not... Uh, I think that's quite important, and also that it's not, it's not a big thing. It should be a part of what's happening all the time at your job or in your school or when you meet your relatives. They are sometimes the worst, I can say personally, some of them. So, so, it's, uh, so this is what, what can be done. I mean, you, can, you, can't, you can't take down the moon, but you can always uh, have a, a discussion, and things won't change tomorrow, but in the long run, if people do that, Sometimes things might change. Uh, another thing in connection with this that we should sometimes we should join about things and go together and, and all this and happy, clappy, whatever. <laughs> uh, but an, another idea, and this is what I got from reading loads of, of uh, scientists investigating what's good to do about these kind of parties, is also that you should meet them uh, not with other kinds of politics. They have a certain way of promoting things and telling things. But you should actually maybe not say the same, all of you. If you're, if you're, if you're from a left-wing party, you might have another way of talking to them as if you're from the right side of the politics. And it's good because you have a diversity. We have a pluralistic society. Even in politics, you have loads of things that you can think of. 
Uh, and most of them would be inside the democratic society, perfectly normal. And then there are some people that are sort of moving out of the democracy. But it's a good thing that you have different opinions and you express them because it's a good society where people have lots of different opinions. And then they have an idea that one thing is the truth and then another one that's not the truth. But we have many ways of looking at things. And that's good, I think. I was going to say one last word, okay? Uh, in the fact, we are violating Article 4 in the Convention, Race the Convention. We are violating a convention, juridical binding document, every day when we let political racist party come into our streets, squares, like Swed Swedish party, and end up in our uh, parliament, in municipalities and at national levels. Just to be aware of that we are violating this article every day. And not everyone is no knows about it, as you said before. No, I mean, the knowledge about no, those kind of but things. But this is what yeah. I mean. We have to have knowledge in school. We have to know what society we want to have and what kind of criminal acts we are doing. I think... To steal a bicycle is not that bad when, if, when you know that you are doing another criminal act like violating everybody human's rights. This is, mo for me, more violation. <clears throat> or, if you, or if you are on the street begging for food, this is, they also want to make this as a criminal act. I mean, for real. I, I know we're, we're over time, but I st still think that you should be able to say something, the, the three of you, before we I close. I just want huh? to tell you all to read um, Martin Gellin, who works for Doggins Nieheider, but he has an article from November 13th in Salon.com. And um, not, I don't want to leave you on a downer note, but it talks about how the American, two prominent American neo-Nazis were just in Hungary meeting with the UKIP people and all of these guys because one of the reasons I'm here today is all of these guys on the hate side of the equation are incredibly well networked. They all talk to one another on the internet. They all know what each other is doing. And we on the love side of the equation don't really know what each other is doing and we don't learn from each other's battles. So keep talking to each other. Talk to Annette and Annalena and Democrati Academy and just keep working on this side and do go read about the, what those other guys are doing. I guess we're going to continue on a theme of giving you homework. Um, there is a group that we've worked with in the past out of, out of London called Hope Not Hate, uh, run by Nick Lowe's, uh, who also is a uh, writer and editor with Searchlight magazine, which is similar to Expo uh, here in Sweden. And what Nick has put together is a campaign called Hope Not Hate that has effectively uh, campaigned against the British National Party which is uh, their version of the Sweden Democrats, so please check them out. I just want us to give applause to Soraya because she must go to her flight. Can we like, like say, Thank you. <laughs> sorry. sorry. Sorry, Kevin. Yeah. You, you might call yeah. you, you finished? That was it. <laughs> that was it, okay, thank you very much. Uh, and the last words from Brian, please. Well, I, w I would just wish that we were as, as proud of the anti-racist movements in Sweden as Pope Francis is, and, and, and that we uh, would, would understand that it's through gatherings like this in Sweden over the past several decades uh, that, that, that we have created a society with uh, such energy and readiness to engage with these topics, to discuss these topics, to insist on human equality, uh, that, that, that that could be one part of, 
uh, of our, our self-definition as, as, as Swedes, a, a, a kind of uh, humane way of loving one's country, the, the internationalist patriotism that uh, Arne Ruth once wrote had replaced uh, ordinary nationalism in Sweden. Uh, and, and, and to see that a gathering like this uh, is, is, is one of the, the most beautiful flowers of, of, of that development. Here, here. So, so that's, that's the end of it. Thank you very much, all of you and all of you. Yeah. Give them all applause.